Hi, I'm Sarah Maurer, and today we'll be talking about the chemical configuration of two of our four biopolymers, DNA and proteins. At the origin of life, a prebiotic mixture of chemicals, which was pretty diverse, organized into a living system, and then through evolutionary history evolved to what we see today. So at the origin of life, we had a diverse mixture, kind of as you can see in this table. This is the yields from our spark discharge experiment. And this chemical mixture is not necessarily what you would see if you, for example, ground up a bunch of cells and looked at their chemical composition. This consists of some amino acids like glycine and alanine in pretty significant amounts, but it also contains some other molecules like hydroxybutyric acid, which you might not say is really important for living things. And so how did life select these chemicals from this mixture? And then what of what we see today is from a long evolutionary history of selection and evolution? We have 20 L-alpha amino acids in our proteins, and that's a pretty specific chemical con configuration. We also have four DNA nucleotides and four RNA nucleotides. And those nucleotides have D sugars in them. So what part of that chemical configuration was prebiotic and what part of that chemical configuration is evolutionary? One of the major considerations of both DNA and proteins is that they're chiral. And if you remember, chirality is the ability of a molecule to rotate polarized light. So all of our amino acids rotate polarized light to the left, and all of our sugars, including the sugars and nucleotides, rotate polarized light to the right. And so we call them L amino acids and D sugars. Now, how did this chirality come about? When most prebiotic reactions occur, they generate an achiral mixture, meaning an equal amount of L and D molecules. And so originally, maybe 50 years ago, people thought that chirality was one way we could detect life. If you found chirality elsewhere in the solar system, maybe that would indicate that there was a biological process going on. It turns out that if you look at carbon-containing meteorites, most of these meteorites have amino acids that are enriched in L amino acids. We call this an enantiomeric excess, which you see abbreviated often as EE. And so if we have an L enantiomeric excess, that would mean that uh, some percentage more than 50% is in the L configuration. And so in the table, you can see uh, isoleucine is the first row, and it has an L enantiomeric excess of up to 50% in some of these carbon-containing meteorites, which is a significant amount of enrichment for the L chirality. It turns out that if you take L amino acids and even make them into small L peptides, when those interact with sugar molecules, you preferentially get D sugars to form. And so just by simply getting L amino acids, we can have the production of D sugars. So one will follow the other. It seems like maybe then chirality is a prebiotic phenomenon where we have meteoritic de delivery of enantiomeric excesses, which lead to an excess of chiral containing molecules like amino acids. Chirality is just one part of the amino acid though. There were a lot of different molecules in the prebiotic soup that could have become polymers. So instead of having an amino acid, which has an amine and a carboxylic acid, Maybe we could replace the amine with something like a hydroxyl group or a sulfhydryl group, making an hydroxy acid or a thioacid. Or we could re replace the carboxylic acid with something like a sulfonic acid or a phosphinic acid. And so what made the amino acid the most favorable? It turns out that the peptide bond is actually a very strong bond compared to something like an ester bond that you would see formed through the hydroxy acid. The other thing that makes the amino acid peptide bond more favorable is the amine can actually form hydrogen bonds with the carboxylate. And so that gives it an additional ability to form secondary and tertiary structures. The next part of an amino acid that could have been selected for differently is the position of the residue. So in amino acids, the side chain that gives the amino acid its, um, its identity, such as the difference between phenylalanine and glycine, is that 
that residue is on the carbon that's next to the C double bond O. That's called an alpha amino acid because it's on the alpha carbon. We could also put that residue on the beta carbon, the second carbon, or even making the amino acid longer and longer, a gamma or a delta amino acid. Um, there are also other possible derivatives that I'll talk about. And then the other question is, why do we only have 20 amino acids? Why aren't there 30? And why aren't there just 10? And finally, why these specific 20? We also made things like norvaline. So why is norvaline not included, even though it was in our prebiotic soup, and instead we have valine, which is arguably a longer molecule? Um, and so there are lots of constraints, both prebiotically and evolutionarily, on amino acid selection. But we think that especially the alpha configuration and the amino group uh, being there is that the prebiotic availability was pretty high, but also the, the products that are formed from the polymers are more stable and they form more uh, functional molecules. So if we just deconstruct our prebiotic amino acids a little bit, you can see that there are a bunch of different prebiotic amino acids that have been found both in the Murchison meteorite and spark discharge experiments. And in this table, the number of pluses indicate its relative abundance. And I've color co coded this image. And so you can see that the standard amino acids are black. And this uh, standard amino acid structure that you see at the top is glycine, the simplest amino acid. Um, and then there are several other types of amino acids. So we have dialkyl amino acids in blue. We have beta and gamma substituted amino acids in green. We have non-standard amino acids like the norvaline that I was talking about in red. And then we have amino substituted, meaning there is an additional functional group on the amine in orange. And so many of these are found in both the Murchison meteorite and in spark discharge experiments. And in fact, even in higher abundances than we see in the amino acids that perhaps were selected for. And so what led to this selection? Uh, it's likely that some of this selection was due to stability, but it could have been that more of them were selected and then evolution deleted some of these later on the historical timeline. We can look at our current proteins, so, and we can kind of deconstruct what we think was a primitive alphabet for, for at the origin of life. And so if you take all of the proteins that are found in the protein database and look at the relative abundance of amino acids, you can actually count the number of each amino acid in all, all known proteins. And so in this graph, we have prokaryotic proteins in black and eukaryotic proteins in white. And we can see that some amino acids are much more abundant in proteins than other amino acids. The ones that have the red asterisk above it are amino acids that are not really found in prebiotic syntheses. Um, and you can see those prebiotic syntheses kind of listed below as meteorite uh, contributions, uh, spark discharge experiments, and hydrogen cyanide polymerizations that produce amino acids. And what we see is that the amino acids that are in lower abundances in known proteins actually are less likely to be found in prebiotic experiments. And so this kind of indicates that maybe at the origin of life, we had only a few amino acids, maybe eight, maybe 10. Um, and then as life evolved, we figured out how to synthesize new amino acids and incorporate them into proteins. And that made our proteins more functional and therefore our cells became more fit. Um, it is also kind of a general rule that amino acids that are sulfur containing or that are aromatics or that contain nitrogens in their side chains are not really considered prebiotic. So we think that in amino acids, that chirality and maybe the alpha amino acid structure was prebiotic, but that the actual number of amino acids and their chemical configurations uh, could have evolved over time. If we talk about nucleic acids, Nucleic acids are a much more complex structure than are amino acids, right? They're not composed of a backbone and a single side chain. They have a base, which is very large, and then they have a sugar, which is also a pretty large molecule. It has a large number of atoms in it. 
and then there's a phosphate that's connecting them. So the backbone, the phosphate sugar backbone is significantly bigger than the amino acid backbone, the peptide backbone. Um, and then the base is really much larger than the amino acid side chains. And so how are these selected for? The chemical configuration of nucleic acids is much more constrained than of amino acids. And so when we think about uh, all DNA being the same, it turns out that's not really true. So there are natural nucleic acids that are not DNA. And as you can see in this large table, there's a pretty large list of, amino or of nucleic acids that are uh, modified from what we normally think of as you know, cytosine or adenine. We see methylations of these groups, but we also see more complex modifications like ester modifications of these nucleic acids. The other thing that we see is that in some of these natural nucleic acids that aren't actually DNA, we replace ribose with things like glucose or galactose. And so it's possible that even in our existing cells that we have nucleic acids that are not in this specific chemical configuration. So let's talk specifically about the sugar ribose, because this is our D sugar, our chiral sugar, which we think probably arose prebiotically. Ribose is a five carbon sugar, and five carbon sugars can fold up into four conformational forms. So we see the linear chain on the left, and then this can fold up either into a five-membered ring or a six-membered ring. And it, in the five-membered ring, it can either have its hydroxyl group um, on, in the beta conformation where the OH is up, like you see in DNA, or in the alpha conformation where the OH is down, like you see in uh, some of the more common sugars like glucose. And so the difference between a furan and a pyran for a five carbon sugar is that the terminal uh, CH2OH disappears in your pyranose form. And so we, for a furan, a five-membered ring, we have that CH2OH hanging out up top. So this is where we attach our phosphate group on our nucleotide. So it's really important that we have a CH2OH to attach a phosphate group to. And it's really important that we have a beta sugar so that we can attach our base to it, right? We need those two attachment points so that we can form our DNA strand. If you look at the 3D pentoses, you can see that they all have a different equilibrium distribution of pyranose and furanose, and also of alpha and beta. And the only one of the three that forms a significant amount of beta furan is ribose. And so ribose naturally becomes the five carbon sugar to select for when we're choosing a sugar for a DNA molecule. Not only do we have to look within the five carbon sugars, but we can also compare more or less numbers of carbons. And so maybe why did we not have a three carbon sugar? And also why are we not using a six carbon sugar? So in this list, you can see uh, a large number of sugar alcohols up to seven carbons and then several um, regular sugars from five to seven carbons. And it turns out that it's more expensive to synthesize a six carbon sugar than to synthesize a five carbon sugar. And so we kind of prefer five carbon sugars over longer carbons. And five carbon sugars are the shortest sugars that you can get to form a ring structure. And so they're really favored for this um, DNA formation because they can make that furanose form. The other thing that makes ribose a really good sugar for DNA is that ribose has a really unique permeability compared to other sugars when you're looking at its ability to go through a cell membrane. And so if ribose is being prebiotically synthesized, it would selectively permeate a membrane and then once it's inside, maybe be transformed into, let's say, a sugar phosphate, and that sugar phosphate couldn't permeate back out. And so because ribose has the fastest permeability, maybe it was selected for not because of all of its other factors, but simply because it was the sugar that could best get into the cell and be functional. We have tested alternative sugars for their ability to support double helices and for their ability to form uh, 
Watson and Crick base pairs, essentially. And so you can replace ribose with a large number of other sugars. You can see these four sugar structures listed here. We have a ribose that is locked into conformation. We have a glycerol that can form as a backbone unit. Um, you can also have smaller sugars like threoses or hexoses, larger sugars, that will also support DNA formation. And so it's possible that other sugars could have been present and were late, then later evolutionarily selected away from. We can also change the base uh, or the base pairing in our genetic code. So some researchers have showed that you can make a third base pair, not just a CG or an AT base pair, um, but also there is a possibility of a second type of base or a third type of base pairing where the partners would not actually form base pairing with either C or T. And so this is an example of expanding the genetic code or allowing for a second type of genetic code. So you can imagine a C G and a ZP base pair system instead of an AT base pair system. We also can possibly modify the phosphates, although these are more restricted. Um, we see that you can replace the oxygen with different um, atoms. So you can replace the oxygen with boron or sulfur or selenium or hydrogen and still get DNA to function. This is really designed for things like gene therapy where you don't want the DNA to be broken down by normal enzymes within the cell, you want it to persist so that it can serve its gene therapy function. And so you modify the DNA so essentially the phosphate bond can't be broken. Um, and this is a great method for synthetic chemistry and for drug design, um, although it may have limited relevance to the origins of life. So with all of these possible modifications, you can see that the space for DNA uh, to be different is quite large. Um, in this figure, we have base modifications on the z-axis, we have sugar modifications on maybe the y-axis, and then backbone modifications on the x-axis. And you can imagine that you could have both a base modification and a sugar modification that would still be a functional information polymer that could form base pairs, but also maybe fold up into catalytic structures. And so, there is a large number of possible alternatives to DNA. That leads us to the question, how did life really choose? And we talked about many of these things throughout this lecture, where there is a prebiotic selection pressure, which is related to the ability, the availability of the monomers, the stability of the monomers, and then also the stability of the polymer backbone and the functionality of those. And then Later, once life has evolved, there's a biotic selection pressure, which would involve both the cost of biosynthesis pitted or versus the increased functionality of those um, modified polymers. And so with the huge diversity of possible polymers for both our proteins, our catalytic core of our cell and our information portion of our cell, our DNA, would we, or would we expect to see, if we find life again, that these very specific chemical conformations were seen twice? 